The query on the left is a Postgres query, and the query on the right is a QuestDB query to do exactly the same thing. But QuestDB doesn't just have better query ergonomics, it has extremely fast write performance for time series data. Most applications either produce or consume some kind of time series data, whether it's to predict the stock market, record customer behavior on a video streaming platform, or display analytics in a web application. Now, nothing will prevent you from using a traditional database to store time series data, but doing so can be cumbersome, both in terms of ingestion performance and query language features. So why is QuestDB so well suited for time travel? Well, generally speaking, the more a database can assume about the data it's storing, the more specialized features and optimizations it can offer. That can mean more elegant queries, better ingestion performance, and so on. For example, in the case of time series data, one desirable feature is the ability to archive old data because it's less likely to be needed. QuestDB has official client libraries in seven languages, including one for Rust, which we'll take for a spin in a few minutes. This video is sponsored by QuestDB, which I'm really happy about because time series data is so ubiquitous and it often tends to be ushered into a traditional database, which means there are potential performance benefits and time series specific features that are being left on the table. I've actually personally fallen into this trap before and with with what I know now, there's no way I'm ever doing that again. Let's take a look at some of the features that might make QuestDB a good fit for a lot of use cases involving time series data. This is the QuestDB web UI. You can see it's pretty slick and modern. I have two tables in the upper left here, one called BTC and another called Energy. I have my query editor here and the results down here. Pretty straightforward. My BTC table has data about Bitcoin on a daily cadence. And my Energy table has information about the energy output of a country on an hourly cadence. Let's take a quick look at the Bitcoin table. Table. So select star from BTC. You can see it has a bunch of columns that we don't really care about, but it also has a column called price USD, which we do care about. So we're gonna go ahead and narrow this down to the timestamp and the price USD column, run that. And we can see two columns one for timestamp and one for price in US dollars. I did mention that each row in the BTC table represents one day of data. What if we wanna get the average price of Bitcoin in 30 day intervals? So we wanna take all the data in this table and we wanna bucket it into 30 day intervals and see the average for each of those intervals. QuestDB has something really useful called a sample by clause that'll help you do that. Sample by is sort of like group by in a traditional database, but instead of looking for duplicate values in a given column, it works with timestamps. So to do sample by, we can do select time, we want time in our output, and then we can use an aggregate function, AVG of price USD, and then we're gonna name that as price USD from BTC, and then we can just do sample by, and then an interval, so we can do 30 days. So now we can see our output data is on a monthly cadence instead of a daily cadence. So we get the average price of Bitcoin across all the days in that month. This is actually non-trivial to do in a traditional database like Postgres. Let me show you what that might look like. I'm actually gonna copy and paste this query because it's pretty atrocious. I'm not really gonna go over how it works, but this is roughly what you'd have to do if you wanna get the same result in the Postgres world. So you have to do a lot of arithmetic. I mentioned I made the mistake once of putting time series data in a traditional database, and we had things like this all over the code. It was pretty bad. This QuestDB version is a lot nicer. Say we wanna get all the data in the BTC table between two timestamps. QuestDB has something to help with this called the in clause. The in clause allows you to specify a start time and an interval to get the data you're looking for. So if I want to get all the data from September 27th, 2021, and seven days after that, I can just do time and price USD from BTC, where time in, and then this is just the normal string, 2021, September 27th, and then I just do a semicolon, and then the interval that I want, semicolon 7D, and that should give me everything between September 27th, 2021, and seven days after that, which is October 4th, 2021. That's a lot simpler than the Postgres equivalent, so you have to do a little arithmetic here. You have to use between 2021, 09, 27, and it's between that start time and 2021-09-27, cast that to a date, and then add an interval to that, so seven days, and then cast that to an interval. So that's how you'd get the same thing in the Postgres world. Let's do time and price USD. Not nearly as bad as the previous query we looked at, but the QuestDB version is definitely a lot more concise. I mentioned that the data collection intervals for the BTC table and the energy table are different. BTC is collected every day and energy is collected every hour. Let's look quickly at the energy table. Select star from energy. 
Yeah, and you can see we get a data point per hour instead of per day. What if we wanna do a join such that we get the energy output of a country for each hour, and then we join that with the price of Bitcoin for that hour. Now the BTC table has a record per day, not per hour, but say we consider the daily price for Bitcoin in that hour as sufficient. In a traditional database, you'd have to jump through some hoops to actually get this, but QuestDB makes it really simple with something called an as of join. So again, in my output, I want a record for each hour, and then I want the amount of nuclear power generated by the country for that hour, along with the price of Bitcoin in that day. To do that, we do select energy dot time, energy dot generation nuclear. It's one of the many columns in that table. And then BTC dot price USD. And then all I have to do is from energy as of join BTC. Notice I'm not specifying any columns in the join, just as of join BTC. And I get exactly what I'm looking for. I have a record for each hour, I have generation nuclear, and then I have the price of Bitcoin for that day. To do this in a traditional database, you probably have to have a complex join clause here that's doing comparisons between columns. The QuestDB version is a lot more ergonomic. I mentioned QuestDB has native clients in seven different languages, including Rust. So let's take a look at what that looks like and see how we ingest data into QuestDB. First, we're gonna create the project. And then we're gonna add the QuestDB client crate, which is questdb-rs. And now we'll open it in VS Code. The QuestDB client has something called a sender, which is what allows us to actually connect to the database. And we're gonna have our main function return a result to make things a little bit easier on us. So we can use the question mark operator. The QuestDB client also provides a struct called buffer, which allows us to specify the data that we're gonna ingest. At the end of the main function, we're just gonna return okay to get rid of this error under result here. So now we've built a sender using sender builder and we've specified localhost and port 9009 as the thing to connect to. Now we just need to use our buffer to specify the data that we wanna ingest. So specify the table name, BTC, and then the columns that we wanna populate for this data point. The first argument is the column name, and the second argument is the value. And then we need to specify a timestamp for this record. So we'll just do at now, which will automatically populate that record with the current time. Then we do center.flush, pass a mutable reference to buffer, and that should be all we need to do. Oops, we need to underscore F64 here. The dot table and the dot column F64 can return errors potentially, so we're just gonna propagate that up the stack for now. This should be all we need. We're gonna run this program and we should expect to see a new record in the BTC table as a result of running it. Cargo run. It ran successfully, so now let's look at the table and see if our record's there. And you can see that worked. We see our new record here and the value that we specified, 30. The QuestDB client library is pretty easy to use. Another nice feature of QuestDB is that it allows you to detach and reattach partitions on demand. You can see the BTC table here has a little year kind of tag next to it. That means it's partitioned by year. And you specify the partitioning scheme when you create the table. So if I wanna do create table stuff, and it's gonna have some data, a long, a string, a timestamp. And then we're gonna designate the special timestamp column using timestamp C. We're saying that we want column C to be the timestamp that's used for partitioning. And then partition by year. So that'll make this new table stuff and it's partition by year. When you specify an interval to partition by on disk, it actually creates a directory for each of those partitions. So in this case, it would have a, a directory for 2020, 2021. On demand, you can detach and reattach those partitions. So you can detach a partition because it's not really needed anymore and you wanna put it into some cheaper storage or get rid of it altogether. To do that, we're gonna try detaching and reattaching a partition of the BTC table. If we actually look at the way QuestDB stores the BTC table on disk, we can see that there there's a directory for each year. To detach a partition, we can do alter table BTC, detach partition list, and then pick a year, 2012. Looks like that worked. Once a partition is detached, a dot detached is added to the name of the directory on disk. So let's take a look at that. You can see 2012 is now renamed to 2012.detached. At this point, none of the data from 2012 should appear in our queries. And you can see there's a big gap for 2012. We go 2011 to 2013. So yeah, that data is no longer reflected in queries. And we can take this directory, this 2012.detached directory and store it wherever we want. To get a directory ready to be reattached, we need to first rename it to .attachable. Let's seed into this directory here. 
and then we'll rename it. It's currently called 2012.detached. We'll call it 2012.attachable. See if that worked. And then in the quest DB UI, we can do alter table BTC attach partition list and then 2012. Run just that line. Now let's see if that's reflected in queries. Yep, 2012 is back. Because in a lot of cases, the value of time series data goes down as it gets older and older, this can be useful in preventing the storage on the database from filling up because you have a bunch of data from a long time ago that you don't really even need anymore. So you can go ahead and archive that somewhere else, either put it in another Quest DB that's less frequently accessed or put it in cold storage or whatever you need to do. I did wanna show you how I populated these BTC and energy tables from CSV files. It's actually pretty simple. The first thing you need to do is open a Quest DB config file and tell it what directory you want it to load CSV files from. On a Mac, if you installed QuestDB via Homebrew, by default that file is here. Let's open it up. The configuration parameter you want to change is called cairo.sql.copy.root, and in my case I've set it to a directory that I want my CSV files to be loaded from. Once we have our configuration squared away, we can use the copy command to actually load the CSV into a table. I already have an energy table, so I'm going to call this energy2. We specify a file name to copy from, and again, that file needs to be in the directory that we specified for the Cairo configuration in the QuestDB configuration file. We specify whether that file has a header. CSV files may or may not have a header that has the column names in it. This particular one does. Then we specify which of those columns is a timestamp. Ours happens to be called time. Finally, we specify a timestamp format that'll tell QuestDB how to convert the timestamps in the CSV file to QuestDB's timestamp type. Those are some of the coolest features of QuestDB. Again, it's free and open source, so I hope you go and check it out. And I hope now that maybe you're like me and you're going to think twice about putting time series data into a traditional database. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.